Well, I guess I'll, I will get started now. It's just a little bit after seven. So welcome to Evening at Egan. Um, this virtual event is hosted by the Juno campus of UAS. And all of the campuses of UAS, including Sitka and Ketchikan, reside in Clinkett territory. The Akabe campus in Juno is located on the land of the Akwan people. And I ask you to please join me in acknowledging the Akwan and the greater Clinkett community, the elders both past and present, as well as future generations. My name is Kitty Labounty, and I'm biology faculty over at the Sitka campus. And most years I've been hosting a natural history speaker series over here. And this fall, I'm very thankful to be able to partner with Evenings at Egan and include a few speakers that I would have hosted over here in Sitka. Tonight's speaker is Jim Bachtel, who's the Tongass Forest Geologist. And since he arrived in 1990, he's contributed mightily to the understanding of the geological, glacial, and biological history of Southeast Alaska. And in recognition of his contributions, UAS awarded Jim an honorary doctorate in 2013. So besides being a fantastic geologist, he's an avid hunter, a great guy, and I might say he's a pretty good van driver in terms of tour buses. And I feel very fortunate um, to call him a friend. So please help me welcome Jim Bachtal. And remember, do mute yourself unless you're the speaker. There we go. Well, thank you all for signing up for this. This is a new experience for me to be able to uh, talk to people from all places instead of just in the Egan building in, in uh, Sitka. I'm gonna give you a smattering of stuff on the glacial and sea level history of Southeast. Uh, it's kind of an updated continuing research and it really is continuing. It's, it's, some of it is changing daily as we develop new ideas and new concepts and get new data. So I'm just gonna hit a broad brush of stuff, kind of where we're at with old data and what we're trying to do with some new things that's going on and tell you what we're working on and show you places we've taken samples. And we don't even have the results back yet, but the kind of things we're gonna get back. So uh, I'll just kind of take you through uh, next hour and, and hopefully we actually maybe about 40 minutes and then hopefully we have enough time for some questions afterwards. So hopefully there's good questions gonna come out of this. Thanks again for coming to this this evening. So this is not clicking. Why is that not clicking? Let's try something else here. Having technical difficulties. There we go. That did it. So kind of enter the ice. Uh, this is going to be a really glacially focused discussion about when did the ice come and when did it leave and how did it leave and what happened to the environments in between? And so basically from 116,000 years ago to about 17,000 years ago, the Cordillian ice sheet advanced and retreated across much of Southeast Alaska. From 21,000 to 17,000 years ago, it made its big last push. This advance erased much of the evidence of past glaciations and climatic fluctuations, but not all. And we're going to take a look at that, not all stuff. So enter the ice, but not yet, because I've got a story to tell. And so this is data from the Vlostok ice core. So we're looking at temperature variation, carbon dioxide, and dust concentrations. And basically over the past roughly 740,000 years, there's been eight glacial cycles, roughly every 100,000 years or so. And this represents the past 420,000 years of data from this one core. And so if you take a look at that, so then like I said before, the last, no, the last interglacial was from 127 to 116,000. The earth was slightly warmer than present, and sea levels were higher than present day sea levels by a meter or a couple of meters. So there was a lot less ice on the landscape at the height of the last interglacial than we have even now. 
And then the last inter, uh, from 116,000 years to 100 to 17,000 years ago, we were in a large cooling trend coming down this spike. And so it basically cooled continuously to the end of the last glaciation. There were a bunch of warm spikes in there, so it wasn't just a nice smooth progression of temperature. And we were somewhere between two and 10 degrees colder on the average than we are now on the Northern Hemisphere. So over this time, the glaciers expanded out of the coast range covering most of Southern and Southeast Alaska. Until the first discovery of the late Pleistocene age bones in the caves on Prince Wells Island in the early 1990s, uh, this is how the glacial coverage of South Alaska was depicted. We were a wall of ice to the edge of the continental margin, 3,000 feet thick until 10,000 years ago. It was a simple model. It had ice everywhere, nothing lived here. The ice came out, pushed down in the land, and it receded, and the land bounced back up. But then we started mucking around and just completely had to threw that whole thing right out. So uh, it's been for me really exciting to see this wall of ice paradigm be shattered and changed over the years. Uh, and our knowledge of how this actually happened greatly expanded. We're gonna talk a lot about deglaciation. And I'm going to use uh, the Plateau Gate Glacier and Watusha Inlet and Glacier Bay is an example because I want to put this into the context of people's lives. That this doesn't necessarily happen over hundreds of thousands of years or tens of thousands of years, that this happens in tens of years. And what we were talk are going to be talking about is probably a more abrupt deglaciation than we experienced here. A good buddy, Greg Strebler, provided me with slides from his own collection taken from one point in 1950 that shows the Plateau Glacier pulling back. So here's 1950. Here's 1969. And there's 1978. And you can see that vegetation started to come in. I also found this reference and the uh, repeat photography for glaciation. So there's 1961 to 2003, roughly 40 years of change. You went from a tidewater glacier in the foreground to early successional plant uh, after deglaciation on the landscape. We hadn't got to the conifer forest yet, but we are definitely developing those plants on that landscape and the ice has completely receded from this. So this does not have to happen in a slow manner. And I want you to think about this, tidal fluctuations on the fronts of tidewater glaciers is causing the calving as they advance today. Imagine a rapid sea level rise with really huge warming of the climate, 6.9 to about 14,000 years ago, combined with the tidal influences. So sea level was rapidly rising because glaciers were melting globally. And at that same time, you still had tidal influences and how fast these glaciers must have pulled back much at a much, much higher rate than even was depicted in this sequence of images. Other things are going on in our glaciers that exist in Alaska today. I was lucky enough in 2018 to go back to nearly the exact spot that uh, Buddington took this photograph in 1925 of the Chickaman and through glacier. So the Chickaman Glacier connected with the through glacier to the left of this image and the Hummel Glacier in 1925. Now they have receded up the valleys and no longer connect with the Chickaman and, and the Hummel and the through are, are just a small vestige of what they once were. The terminus of the glacier has moved up the valley over four miles. And the valley and glacier has receded, uh, showing much of the valley walls and stuff. Although the valley glacier still occupies much of the original valley, uh, it's not as thick as it was. It, best I could tell, it's thin by something like 350 feet across this mass of, of uh, thinning down. So 
this is a, also another rapid change and what's going on in our ice fields are very common in our ice fields in southeastern Alaska today. Need to get some concepts out of the way and have a little bit of fun with some of these concepts. So I'm going to be talking about isostatic depression. So the glaciers come out onto the landscape and there's so much ice that it pushes down on the Earth's mantle and or, or lithosphere and it moves the mantle aside. And so it pushes down on the weight of the ice pushes down on the landscape. As that happens, as it rolls out, it creates a four bulge out front. We're going to go through a little exercise for any of the teachers that's out there that you can do this in your classroom, in the safety of your classroom, in a Pyrex pole or some kind of glass pole. Your static sea level change. All of this ice was being created globally, and so sea levels dropped like 400 feet, somewhere about 120 meters globally. And then as soon as the ice started to warm, things started to warm up at 17,000 years ago, all that ocean started or coming back in. So the ice was melting and the sea level was riding. So that's our eustatic sea level change. So we have land going down because of the weight of the ice. We have the sea dropping because so much ice is being created. Then you have the ocean coming back because the glaciers are melting. We refer to that as relative sea level rise. And so what we're doing is taking what was the sea level in the past compared to where it's at today. And so that's the relative part of the sea levels we're going to be talking about. So kind of where the ice and the stuff was pushed down, that's the mainland, Juneau, Douglas, Admiralty, Ketchikan, Stikine area. Clarence Strait, Chatham Strait, Eastern Baranoff Island was kind of in that hinge area. Western Baranoff Island, parts of, of uh, Western Chichigoff, Prince of Wales Island, and the islands to the west. We're on this four bulge. Not that the ice didn't override a lot of those, but it was a four bulge as it rolled out. And as the ice melted back, it came back to being a four bulge again. Okay, it's hard to get an elephant on a trampoline, and it's really probably not safe to do that in a classroom. So Janet Clark and Jackie Foss and Catherine Prussian and, and some people working on uh, Earth on the Move summer camp in 2017, came up with this idea using flubber to demonstrate isostatic rebound. And uh, it worked so beautifully. So they poured flubber into a deep rectangular Pyrex container and coloring it like the Earth. And then they covered that with plastic wrap. And so basically the flubber in the bowl was the Earth's asthenosphere and the thin layer of plastic wrap with the Earth's lithosphere. And then from the other end, they poured in white flubber as the ice. And you could watch the, the material underneath completely deform and a four bulge develop along the side and then the front. And it was nice because then when we were done and it had stabilized, we could just pick up the plastic and take all of the quote unquote ice off of the upper layer and watch those four bulges relax and the center start to come back up. And I got a video showing that in here. And the end of the storage container functioned very similar to the Queen Charlotte Fault as a barrier to that four bulge migration as that was moving across. So it was a good, a good way to show that. So let's see if we can get this thing to play. I always wonder about embedded. No. Oh. Something's playing somewhere. Oh, this is frustrating. <laughs> it worked right up to the point that I put this on Zoom. Well, We'll provide you a link there at the bottom of how to get back to that small little video that I had, but evidently it's not going to come up and play on this. Sorry. So it was really good uh, in this demonstration. I don't know why now it won't even show up on the slide. All right, we're going to move on. Technical difficulties to overcome.
So my experience with all the shell bearing strata began in 1990 with my first trip to the field. You know, like everywhere we mapped, we found shell bearing strata in the creeks and in the road cuts and in excavations and landslides and ditches and shorelines in the cut banks of shorelines or in the intertidal zone itself. But a dichotomy immediately became apparent. The, the younger shell deposits found on the outer islands surrounding Prince of Wales and, and that area out in there uh, could not be found at a higher elevation no matter how hard we look for those shell deposits. And uh, as we, the, on the inner islands and stuff like that, the shell deposits got higher and older as you move towards the mainland and towards Juno. And so the concept of the four bowls was not discussed and it wasn't something we'd even thought about until it first was published from the Canadian geologist working off the Ida Gwaii in 1997, but then especially a series of papers that came out in 2003 and 2004. So our early understanding everything was it was a result of purely isostatic response to deglaciation. The ice came out, the ice left, the sea invaded the land, and it had risen to where we find the shells today. We had some learning to do, and that has been a fun process to do that. Part of that process was being involved with Kim Hastings, who was working on our PhD called Long-Term Persistence of Isolation Fish Populations in the Alexandria Archipelago. So she thought that isolated cutthroat and Dolly Varden populations was a function of isostatic rebound. And so the isostatic rebound had created some kind of a barrier that left these populations of these lakes. And so she had mapped all over Southeast Alaska where these lakes are at. And she came to me and said, I understand you have some unpublished data on raised marine shell bed stuff, which I had a very small data set at that time. And I worked with her and she mainly put it together, but we came up with like 120 uplifted glacial marine sediment deposits or landforms that were kind of indicative of that. About 50% of them were shell bearing stuff. And from that, she did develop a geologic model, which is on the left, and a biologic model that's on the right. And broke it between the inner and or outer and middle and inner portions of Southeast Alaska. And it was the tremendous similarity between these two that it dawned on me that she had to be onto something here. It might not be purely isostatic, but uh, what she was showing from the biologic realm so mapped the geologic realm that there, there's something to this. And so this kind of began this now 16 year effort to seek out and document these shell bearing sites in Southeast Alaska and try to figure out the processes that put these things where we find them. <clears throat> So these are just examples of what things look like across the island. Uh, a here, the one on the, the right, this is the highest dated shell bearing site that we have. If you've ever gone to Ock Bay and hiked up the Spalding Meadows near Juno, uh, this is up near the old mine site. It's at about 600 and some odd times, 620 some odd feet above sea level, 191 meters. It dates to somewhere a little over 14,000 years. The shell bearing strata sits underneath the Mount Edgecombe tephra that blankets much of Sitka and much of northern southeast Alaska. Uh, these are other typical beds. This uh, B is off of Noya's Island. Uh, C here is off of the inner, lower intertidal zone in, by Irish Creek and Rocky Pass between QU and Kupernoff Island. Uh, and even though that's in the inner tidal zone, that dates to uh, 10,750 years, somewhere in there. And a new one I just found uh, this last year was shown to me by, or shown to me by uh, Michael Kampanich, was basically an 8,900 year old bed of clams underneath a gravel bed in the upper inner tidal in uh, Casa Inlet. One of the important things to understand about this is these blue muds and that these sediments that these are in are anoxic. And so when you actually excavate into that, most of these shells still contain their ligaments. A lot of the litterines and mussel shells and pectin shells and other things still have their bright coloration. 
And so as soon as you bring that out to the atmosphere, they change to a gray color pretty much while you're handling them. So this is a, it's, it's a fascinating thing. And if you want to preserve that color, you've got to, uh, you've got to get it to, uh, that went right by that, there we go. Photograph it while you're taking it out. Another example here, uh, happened to be mapping at Cake, Alaska, um, in the, boy, this thing is just, I turned the laser on. Uh, and happened to be there at the right time where they were excavating this bank coming up along in here. And that was a, a little over a 14,000 year old shell bed uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 80 meters above modern sea level today. The back end of Bostwick Inlet uh, on Gravina Island, here's the deltaic deposits here. So these are the stream gravels over the top of this marine mud that's not too far, only just a few meters above high, high tide. We'll get back to this. This has some interesting stuff, but it's still got all the logs of the estuary and everything else. So basically that's a uh, close to 10,000 year old shell bed at, at or above, just slightly above modern sea level today. Seal Cove on Southern Gravina Island. This one's fascinating because not only does it contain that shell, but it's loaded with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of ice proximal diatoms. It just makes a slurry of diatoms when you wash that sample. It gives us some kind of idea about the ice that was sea ice that was covering the area real close to the edge of the glaciers at the age of this. <laughs> Cape Pole down in Kosciuszko Island, you can see the, the mussel shells here still retain their color in the sediments that were uh, somewhere about 9,600 years old. And again in the Juno area, over as you're going up to the ski area along this creek, this is a test pit that we dug a number of years ago. Uh, and you can see the ages of the shell material here. And again, it's underneath that big, huge blanket of tephra that came out of when Mount Edgecombe and, and, and uh, Crater Ridge erupted in about 13,200 years ago, something like that. So that's a big marker bed. When you're at Sitka, these are some of the shell beds we found. Uh, KK here is, uh, KK Prussian is sitting at the shell bed along the south side of Stargavin Creek. Virtually the road is built over the top of this. This cut bank is underneath the road prism as you drive down that. Um, and DeGroff Bay, the oldest shell bed that we've been able to find is just a, a meter or so of, right above the extreme high tide is right here in the Sitka area. So it's just below the extreme high tide and dates to about 7,600 years old. We don't know the timing of the maximum sea level at Sitka, but what you find are storm during deposits. And what you actually came to realize is you can tell where the highest sea level was in the Sitka area because the Mount Edgecombe tephra is not there. So the waves washed it away. And so as you drive along the road going uh, north out of Sitka where they dig the power poles, they brought up these piles of old storm berm gravels. And immediately above this then the orange tephra of the Mount Edgecombe tephra could be seen. So this gives you some idea. I would bet you that it's somewhere close to the age of the DeGroff Bay stuff, somewhere about 7,600 or 8,000 years old, that that's as high as the sea level ever got in the Sitka area. Kind of a fun one and things that I get constantly taught. This is Sandy Beach where everybody goes to play outside of Thorn Bay been going there for years. And as you walk out onto the beach to the right, a few yards, the upper beach is armored by rounded glacial erratics. And at the base of that slope, the beach turns into sand. And I've been there many times, and you can see the clams in the image there that's washing out. It finally dawned on me they were in growth position and they, were, they represented a dead community of clams. And in there, I could see two clams, the uh, Venus clam and the Arctic surf clam that no longer is in any of our beaches in Southern Southeast Alaska. And in fact, they kind of indicated a more cooler ocean that we have here with that something else. So I took one of the Venus clams and had that dated. It basically dates to 
somewhere between 10,300 and 9,600 calendar years ago. And so like, here's one we've been walking over for 20 or 30 years that had a wealth of information in it. And so it's, you know, it's just kind of the fact that uh, there's so many things you can learn if, and if we just explore and sometimes look right beneath our feet and think about it, that, it, that we've been walking over that for years and yet it's a, a wonderful raised marine show bed site. So we now have compiled a list of over 720 samples that's got 436 radiocarbon dates and you can start to ask questions of that uh, with that kind of a data set. In fact, we just have finished a paper that's submitted for publication and I hope to find out in the next couple of weeks if that's going to move on to the review phase. And uh, so that kind of is a culmination of 30 years of, of work, some work that I've been involved with, but there's been so many other people involved with this. Um, that it's a it's a it's a community project. Come on, here we go. So this is kind of the study area. The gray areas are where the ice is today, because uh, this is not ice left over from the Great Ice Age. All this ice is younger than uh, the last ice age, the Cordelian ice sheet that moved out. And these are where our sites are. And I've colored the areas that we kind of analyzed there in different blocks. But you can kind of see that the red dots and the orange dots are more frequent on the inner part. And it's the blue dots and yellow dots that are more frequent on the outer part. And that's that dichotomy that we had seen early on. But now we can kind of look at it spatially on the landscape. So this is that 700, 700 data points and stuff spread out across the landscape. And so if you take a look at that inner stuff and where you find those shells deposits on the landscape between 40 meters and 229 meters, and some of these places like I imagine up at Haynes and in there at, at Wrangell and Mitkoff Island and, and stuff, we might not have found the highest occurrence of shell yet. This is the highest occurrence that we've found to date which relates to how much ice was on the landscape. So the greater the isostatic depression, the greater, the higher you find the shell up in the hills today. And so this is what we understand today and this could definitely change in time. And the other part of that dichotomy we've seen for all these years is we don't have anything higher, shell beds any higher than 18 meters in this outer coast area. And if you take a think about it, and if you've been traveled throughout Southeast and taken a look at that, in that area where we've had extensive uplift, think about the differences in the landscape of those two areas, the river valleys and estuaries in the zone with the most isostatic uplift are broad and flat with huge grasslands and tidal flats and meandering channels. That's a function of that isostatic uplift. Uplift over time has created those habitats. The river valleys in the areas with the four bulge and collapse do not have those kind of expansive, enormous estuaries and tidal flats. And so the, the differences that we see on that landscape really is a function of that glacial history in these regions. This is a summary chart to show that also that dichotomy. So, Sitka and Prince of Wales and the Outer Islands are the material that's below down here. These kind of these, this is where the shoreline has been through time and all the data points that that's associated with. Then each one of these are the individual islands and stuff on that inner part and part of the mainland, which are showing up in here in these different graphs. Of course, Juno has had the most uplift. And it's interesting that it all happened about, started about the same time rising out above the uh, relative to sea level, but it's gotten to the same point through time. Some of the extremes of this thing, at Juno and Northern Admiralty Island, the land rose at least 170 meters or 560 feet in about 2,800 years. So well, that's about 2.9 inches per year. It was coming up really fast. And think about the dynamics of that. You've got glacial sediments that are eroding. They're trying, streams are trying to find themselves. Channels are down cutting. All this sediment is being 
introduced into that environment while that rapid uplift is going on. At the same time, in, off of Sitka and off of the Outer Islands by Prince of, Wales, Prince of Wales and the Outer Islands, you had a four bulge that started to collapse as that ice was melting and it finally reached its maximum collapse somewhere right in this area here. But what was that in human experience? So from right here at about 11,293, 11,300 years ago, to right here at 10,008, sea level rose relatively about 270 feet, 81 meters. The land was reacting, relaxing and the global sea level was rising. That rate is somewhere about 18.5 centimeters or 7.3 inches a year. And if a person lived to be 50 years old on that landscape, sea level would have risen 9.2 meters or 30 feet in their lifetime. Is it a wonder that the oral traditions of this area and these outer coast areas say the tide grew higher and higher? People had to move their camps where they'd camped year after year after year it was rapidly being put under ocean as that sea level rose. Really dynamic shorelines. Will not let me go down here to do that. There we go. One of the other concepts, so we're back up at Spalding Meadows, and this is one of the little bands of gray material right here is the shell bearing stuff, and this orange right up here is the tephra from Mount Edgecombe. 191 feet, you can go up there and see these things in Ock Bay. Some were about 14,000 years old, give or take a little bit. But the concept to get across here that, that is hard to wrap your head around, it's hard to grasp. I can take you to this spot, you can see the shell material, the glacial marine sediment, you can wash it, you can look at the shells, you can have it dated, you can measure the elevation. But at the time of that deposition, global sea level was 96 meters lower than it is today. The sea invaded the land and then the land rose up. So the total isostatic rebound you have to take where, they, where the sea level was, so 96 meters plus where you find it today, 90, 191 meters, and you come up with 307 meters or somewhere about a thousand feet of isotic rebound. And that's at a minimum. So it's hard to wrap your head around that. The earth is not supposed to be that flexible, is it? It's amazing to think about the earth being able to move that much. So if we look at that area of extreme uplift, extreme glaciation, where the ice was thickest, and we take a look at the oldest stuff that's in there, and we look at the dates that are within the error of each one, basically they could be the same age by the method that we date that, we come up with 44 dates. And we believe that this closely approximates the timing of the maximum transgression or the maximum raising of the, of the sea on the land, the highest flood line on the landscape, or what we sometimes refer to as the bathtub ring. If we do that, we come up with a date of about 14,000 years ago. So this is these 44 dates that are put together. So by 14,000 years, all of the fjords and straits were ice free. So between 169 and 14,000 years, not that long a period, all that ice left Southeast Alaska. Think about the calving ice that that equates to. Think about how many icebergs there must have been in the waters of southeast Alaska and then moved up along the Alaska coastline with our currents. At this time, isolated or stranded ice caps existed on the islands and with the tidewater glaciers, were tidewater glaciers in many valleys. Higher valleys throughout the region were likely occupied by alpine glaciers. With some of the modern coastal rivers, such as the Taku, the Stikine, the Eskut, the Eunuch, the Nass, hosting large tidewater glaciers, and fjords came up to that end of that tidewater glacier. Many of the largest islands, such as Admiralty and Kupernoff, Kuyu, and Bitkoff, consisted of several smaller islands at that time. Again, a really dynamic time in southeast Alaska, a short period of time with the ice moving back out of those fjords across that landscape. One of the other aspects that we've come onto is the possibility that 
we were warmer summers with fire in our ecology. So these are the sites where we have found charcoal somewhere between 7,600 and 11,000 years ago. A lot of charcoal in these sediments. There was a core taken in Shlokam Arm, just north of Sitka, and they looked at the transition of the diatoms and they come up with these very, very unique groups of diatoms through time. One that suggested that we had cold winters and warm summers up to about 6,800 years ago. And so if you take a look at that data that we have with the charcoal, here's our charcoal and the Pacific sardine, which I haven't mentioned yet, but we'll bring up. And so this is the air time when we find the most charcoal right here. And they suggest that this was the big transition. So we could have been much warmer during the summer with much cooler, drier winters until we made that transition to warmer winters and cooler summers that we live in now. So maybe the first folks that came here into Southeast Alaska had a really good time on the beach and it wasn't too bad during the summer. This is to uh, kind of show you that again. There's that line that they defined at 6,800 and you can see how our sites are. One of the people or a lot of people have suggested that the charcoal was a proxy for humans on the landscape and we're not sure that it's not. But one thing I can tell you is if I pick up a sample and it's got charcoal in it, I know that it's older than 6,800 and I know that it is younger than 11, except for the five samples that are down below that line. And we have hundreds of cultural sites in the five to modern day stuff. And so you would expect that if it was a function of humans on the landscape, we should have had charcoal in those sediments completely through this time span and we don't have charcoal in there. So I believe this is an environmental uh, record that we have. And one thing I want to focus now on is the fact that we have this accumulation of, of uh, in the sediments, we have the occurrence of Pacific sardine. So we have both the bones of the sardine <clears throat> that date to over 10,000 years old and the scales of the sardines. So they were numerous enough that they were spawning in our intertidal areas and dying and these sediments have preserved these. Uh, so I took this to uh, the Ock Bay lab and I actually talked to Wing and who published this stuff in 2000 and he said that's interesting because on the extreme El Nino years, 97, 98, 1931 and now uh, in the 2013-2015 El Nino, Sardines showed up in Southeast Alaska. So maybe what this suggests is too, that during that period that we had sardines in these sedimentary records that our oceans were much warmer than what we normally have up here at the same time. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about other things that we're taking a look at, trying to ferret through what is going on with our climate. That's speleothems. We've only taken a few speleothems and looked at them from the caves and we tried to find uh, stalagmites or stalactites or flow tone that has been like frost wedged off of the walls and stuff so we're not actually taking stuff out of the caves and we then have sent this off and so this gentleman just published on that uh, this is only like a five and a half inch long little stalagmite but a tremendous amount of information and time is recorded in that stalagmite uh, and again, looking at the ice cores, here's the ice core information right here. This time out of one out of Greenland ice core. We only have the little periods of record of oxygen isotope and carbon isotope out of the speleothem. But it's interesting that they correspond mainly to these warm spikes, these upward trending spikes in that ice core. So those would have been times where maybe we weren't covered with as much ice and maybe we had precipitation going into in this case El Capitan cave and doing deposition and during these other periods of cold snap and stuff where we don't have any deposition that we had ice covering the cave and it kind of is a good record of that. Studies under the Queen Charlotte fault have really accelerated in the last three years. 
they have completely taken super high resolution bathymetry the entire fault line. This one picture here is basically the coast of Baranoff Island uh, and, and Chichagoff Island outside of Sitka, showing how absolutely linear that fault is on the landscape. They've taken this and they have measured the movement on that fault. They've done seismic profiles across there and a few stuff. The work that we're doing on when did deglaciation happen and when did the ice get out of the fjords relates to how much sediment has come down each of these canyons because what they're measuring then is how much movement there's been along here. One of the best examples is out of the Yacobi Seaway. Over here you can see where the ice used to come out and there was a big lobe of ice that went out to the edge of uh, this valley right out in here, <clears throat> the Continental Shelf. But if you move back up into this square, right at the mouth of Krause Sound, you can see these beautiful glacial moraines as the ice was pulling back into Krause Sound, but you can also see this displacement right here of that fault. So since deglaciation, that fault had moved that much, a beautiful linear line. So they take that in the computer and they move that back and they measure that. And they've done that in 184 places over the length of the fault. And they've come up with basically 50 to 57 millimeters per year, which is the fastest rate of a continental ocean strikes that fall on Earth. And so this boundary that we have outside of Southeast Alaska is moving at a really, really high rate. And it is tied to the development of that fault line and what's been going on along that fault line is tied to that flexure of the earth and how much, how much the ice deformed that and moving that up and down, uh, problem possibly uh, vertically right at that fault line as that four bulge moved out against the Queen Charlotte Fault. I'm going to move on to a new thing that I've been working on with these folks since 2015, cosmogenic or exposure dating. I was not very familiar with this until I had the great opportunity to work with these folks. And this is definitely the way that, of the future in trying to figure out what the ice was doing on the landscape, at least across, generally across Southeast Alaska. So how this works is cosmogenic rays come bouncing down to the earth and they change the mineralogy of rocks. So as these rays come down, if you are a really quartz rich rock, the silica is bombarded and the oxygen and the quartz is transferred into beryllium and the silicon is transferred into aluminum. And the ratio of those two things give you a concentration and they've been able to measure how much that accumulates through time. So if you know what that ratio is, you can figure out how long has that rock been exposed. So glaciers sealed the rocks from cosmic radiation. So the bedrock is being eroded, especially if in case of a warm based ice, the bedrock beneath that sheet is actively being eroded during the ice cover when the glacier is moving. And you have none of these cosmogenic isotopes being developed because the cosmic rays can't get to that bedrock underneath. So as soon as the ice pulls back, it leaves glacial erratics on that landscape and it leaves the bedrock exposed. And so the concept is if these have not been buried and they've not been shaded, then cosmogenic rates can have altered this material in the amount of time. And by measuring that concentration, you can say, how long has that been exposed at those sites? So these are the sites that we chose across Southeast Alaska, Southern Southeast Alaska. We're working our way North. It's taken time. This COVID thing is, has seriously hampered our work we had planned for this last summer. <clears throat> but these are the sites over a three year period that we were able to take a look at in Southeast Alaska. And these are what the sites look like. They're huge erratics left on top of the ridge by glaciers. And so as the ice moved along, it picked up these quartz rich rocks, mainly granites, and they've left them across the landscape. And these minerals then have been altered in that outer rind. So you collect that outer rind of that rock and measure that concentration. 
And here's what the data and the results are. So the, in the western region, these glaciated first along with Alpine glaciers that's on, on Baker Island. So starting at 17,000 years ago, kind of an average of 169, much of that outer coast of those outer islands were deglaciated. You still had a few glaciers up in the Alpine, but they were basically gone, at least on Baker Island, by 15.3. So this is where it started. And this is way, remember the wall of ice thing? Remember the 10,000 years in blanket of ice? Now we're talking about close to 17,000 years ago that we're deglaciated. <clears throat> so then you move inland to the central region, which is kind of Zarimbo, North Prince of Wales, one here at Annan Creek, one down at Volcan Mountain out in here. And that was deglaciated by about 14.9. So you can see that it took a few thousand years for that ice to really pull back. But then, boom, you hit those shell dates. And so right between 14.9 and that, you also have all of these fjords and straits go free of ice. So there was a huge change in this environment somewhere about 14,000 years ago. Ice persisted in the... Uh, mountains surrounding up towards the Canadian border, in this case, up in here in the high mountains, fell about 11.3 to even into 10,000 and stuff like that. But the most of the ice suddenly disappeared at about 14,000 years ago. And so this cosmogenic dating has shown us that across the landscape. <clears throat> the Orca Island, before May of 2018, there'd been some question whether Bjork Island had been overridden by glaciers. Tom Major, a palynologist, had been out there and he wasn't convinced totally that that was overridden. Bjork was mostly underlain by granite, so it was a bedrock type that had a lot of quartz in it. It was a good candidate for exposure dating if erratics were there. I got a chance to go there with uh, KK and Aaron Prussian in 2018. And as we approached the dock on Bjorka, the answer to was a glaciated question was apparent. The granitic bedrock at the entrance to Simons Bay was showed evidence of being completely overridden by ice. And as you pull into the dock, the quarry that they built the dock material out of is completely overridden by a mass of glacial till. And so the, the glacial till that was up in here and the smoothness of these rocks as you go into that bay told me that, yeah, ice had been on the landscape. But was there any erratics there? Could we actually date something? So the center part of the island is almost all wetlands formed by a thin layer of Mount Edgecombe tephra and the weathering of granitic uh, bedrock that's out there. And we found erratics, <clears throat> but we knew that there'd been some Mount Edgecombe tephra land on it, so we wanted to find erratics that allowed us to, or we could imagine, would wash off quickly. So it wouldn't have held Tepper up on top and, and limited the amount of cosmogenic rays that can come down and work on that erratic. So we're careful to choose erratics we thought would not have been covered by Tepper for long. Their shape and position on the landscape would have resulted in the Tepper washing off after the eruption. And we collected samples out in there and not published yet. And these aren't the final dates at all but really, really close. And so we got basically three of them were almost identically the same date. We had one that maybe had been buried a little bit longer and was not as old. But these three here, the average of those is about 15,165. So we could pretty confidently say Bjork Island was ice free and it had left these erratics behind. One of the interesting things that we found above that quarry where we came in was the remnants of an old pond. And in that pond was the eruption history of Mount Edgecombe. Here's the day site tephra that covered all of Southeast Alaska and around Sitka and stuff like that. There was just a few centimeters went south when that thing erupted. So most of it went north and, and, and north uh, east in that eruption across all of, in fact, there's less here than is in Juneau. But here's all of the previous eruptions before that happened. Uh, sitting in my office right now, I've got this silt. I just washed this silt right here and there's organics in there and I got to decide what the, to date. And I washed the base of this basaltic tephra and andesite right here and I found two stems in there that look like they're from either uh, birch or willow. 
And so we can probably get a pretty good date of the base of this basaltic andesitic eruption right here. So that will tell us a little bit too. So this here hopefully should correspond, here's the glacial till at the bottom. That should correspond roughly to 15,200 years ago if the erratic uh, dating was really res uh, res resulted in the, what, you know, the deglaciation that happened out there. <clears throat> it had been postulated for a long portion, that, a long, long time that some of the outer portions of Baranoff Island had been ice free. Uh, not that the local valleys didn't have glaciers in them, but that the plateaus between the valleys looked like they'd not been glaciated based on geomorphic analysis. Well, in 2019, we managed to get down there and make several stops. And I can tell you that it was all glaciated. Uh, some of it, it had, but it deglaciated at different times. We have one erratic at 16.3 and one at 14.3, so there was different rates of deglaciation. These are totally preliminary numbers that have not been corrected yet. Uh, in fact, I just got them in the last few weeks. But here's what that landscape looked like. Um, here you can see the gigantic chatter marks where the ice went over the granite. Here again, chatter marks where the ice went over the granite and big scours where the ice went across the landscape. So there was still a lot of ice and a lot of weight at this spot on the outer coast of Baranoff when the ice went over these spots. And these were some of the erratics that were, uh, one of the dates came off of each of these right here. So we're trying to expand that across uh, Baranoff and up along Baranoff on both sides of the Baranoff wilderness because we can't land in there with a helicopter. I have not got any dates back yet, but last summer, believe it or not, there was actually one good weather day and we had a researcher in Juneau and he rented a helicopter and he flew out to Northern Kruzoff Island and there is one knob out there that's granitic and he was able to sample the bedrock up there and he sampled actually about 15 erratics and some of the bedrock along this ridge. And we'll find out, we'll find out when Northern Kruzoff Island was exposed out of the ice. Uh, they went above Deep Bay and stopped up on the ridge up in here going back at a transect towards Juno and they sampled erratics up on the ridge up above Deep Bay and they went right above Peril Strait up into here into two spots and sampled erratics as you moved across the landscape. And so all of this is pending. We have no results back yet but those, we want to really expand uh, Caleb Wilcott is working on a master's thesis and we'd like to expand those samplings across Baranoff and Chichagoff Islands this next summer if we get a chance to. I personally have been recording glacial striations and, and glacial gouges and scours for years and years and years and years. And I have got hundreds of notes on these in notebook and we were able to digitize these most recently. And I always wanted to map kind of the ice flow directions, but then we got LIDAR and it was like blinders off. So in 2017 and 2018, we got submeter LIDAR for almost all of Prince of Wales and most of the outer islands. <clears throat> and this is what it looks like. And these are called crag and tails. These are a bedlock high with a trail of glacial till coming off of it where you can precisely see the azimuth in which the ice moved across the landscape. We have now digitized all of these. We have thousands of these things digitized based off the LIDAR. In the central Prince of Wales, this is the Thorn River Valley right here. And these are all the drumlins in the Thorn River Valley. These are the drumlins right across from Clark Bay where the ferry comes into Hollis. You got crag and tails and drumlins. This one here is about three miles in length, for instance, on scale. And so it got all of these beautiful features, some little till ridges that was left as the ice was pulling back. Uh, just the, the information that can come off of this is phenomenal. We've been getting pretty high resolution multi beam bathymetry. We would have never thought that the ice from Dixon entrance would have gone north. But this is a net island. This is Revilla Island. Ketchikan is just up channel right here. And here is the end of the ice that came up from the south out of Dixon entrance. And this is the glacial moraine in the bot. Now it's under the ocean. In fact, this is a really good halibut fishing structure right here. 
Uh, but here's the moraine going north where the sediment pulled off. And this is the moraine, an 800 foot high moraine between Cassan Peninsula and the Cleveland Peninsula between Prince of Wales and the mainland right here. So we now know without a, with total certainty that the eye had moved forward out of Dixon entrance. We also know it moved forward out of Dixon entrance because outside of Craig, Here's Craig, Alaska, the community right here and the highway coming down to it, are hundreds of drumlins. Here's the glacial moraines that were left when the ice pulled back. And that ice flow structures, all of this taken together, flows out and goes out up the Gulf of Escabella and around the north side of Noyes. We often wondered if the ice made it out south of Hecate or Sumez Island. Here are crag and tails on the bottom of the ocean off the bathymetry just south of Sumez Island. So we know that this area was totally overridden by ice. We've taken all of that data in the huge data set, and this is an oversimplified map of that ice flow. But the big epiphanies that came of that were the fact that ice came out of Dixon entrance and went up the backside of Doll Island and went out by Noyes. Ice came up Clarence Strait and stopped right here. Ice came up towards Ketchikan and stopped right where Beam Canal comes around the end right here. And an, an enormous lobe of ice came right down across the Rimbo and across central Prince of Wales and pushed out about out to here in Sea Otter Sound. Uh, like the azimuth is like 220 degrees. It is like all of the glacial striations and all the features you see of the landscape shows this ice moving down across here. So it gives us a different idea of how ice moved on that landscape. The cosmogenic data gives us an idea of when the glacial striations and all these other features give us how did the ice move on that landscape. Starting in 2009, working mainly with Risa Carlson, a Forest Service archaeologist, and a lot of other folks, we came up with an idea about using the shell beds to predict paleo shorelines. And from that, so all of the, the uh, dots down here are shell beds, and this was the predicted shoreline, and all these purple dots up here were cultural sites that we found in the preceding years looking for sites based on the fact that this ought to have been the elevation that people were living at through time. <clears throat> One of the key features of that that bugged me for years was these dates right here, all of these older, older clam dates right here, we never could find any human occupation that was the age of these older clam dates. And I couldn't, I couldn't rationalize why. I didn't have a full understanding of this concept of a four bolt. <clears throat> then we went to work at a site, a series of sites, and mapped the, the res cultural resources around uh, Whale Pass. And I could measure and physically see four distinct terraces. But the shell beds right here stopped. These shell bed elevations would have never predicted these terraces. So I knew that somehow we had flaws in the model that we had created using shell beds to predict stuff. So while I was scratching my head on that and trying to figure out so we could see by our mapping that these terraces had radiocarbon years, eight to 9,000 year old human occupations on there. And these terraces were five to 8,000 year old. And these were 17 to 5,000 years old. And this was 1,700 years and younger. And you could take that to the bank. And they were really, really predictable what you're going to find on those terraces. Then we got the LIDAR. And you can see without a doubt the multiple terraces and that old shoreline that comes around. So this is this shoreline that's right here is the shoreline when the four bulge collapsed. It collapsed to a point that it met the rising sea. And that's the that is the cut bank or that is the erosional surface of that highest shell. So you can see here's all the glacial features coming down, the scours from the ice age, and they're truncated right along that line. But below that are all of these terraces in here. And we can now go and do cross sections on the LIDAR and measure those terraces and model that. And that still equates to the oldest cultural sites 
being up here at the higher elevation and progressively getting younger with time, depending on where you're at on the landscape. So that's just a really powerful tool using that LIDAR to do that. Now I won't let me do this again. Okay. Here's another example, a little bit further down. This just east of Halibut Nose uh, near Heidelberg. It's a little bit to the west of Heidelberg. You can see these beautiful, these are storm berms with this, like the trailing sand still coming off of it. This is all covered with timber today. You, if you looked at this on the land, this is what the bare earth looks like. Here's an alluvial fan that was truncated by the rising sea. And all the shorelines and stuff you can see very clearly coming around and what would, would have been an island out there that's not today. This is the forested ridge. Uh, here's actually the edge of the glacial material that's been eroded and there's a little landslide that's come off the front of that glacier from the wave action on there. So you can just get incredibly accurate understanding of where sea level was through time. One of the most extravagant ones, this is Arena Cove on southern uh, Sumez Island. Uh, going up to about a 25 meter terrace that runs right along up in here, which you can see that modeled over on this side over in here. Almost constant uplift through time. Um, I'm hoping to get into this river channel and look in this cut bank. There should be organics in there where you could actually go and radiocarbon date each of these layers coming down that and actually get a really precise how fast was the land rising uh, look at this this area through time. So LIDAR has completely changed the way we model those shorelines. <clears throat> so thinking about that dichotomy, thinking about the fact that we got this area that we don't know shells are above eight or 18 meters. And what about those oldest shells? What if the oldest shells gave us the minimum age of that upper terrace. In other words, the sea invaded the land. There was a little bit of equilibrium reached between the sea and the land and intertidal mollusks got established. Maybe that would really give us some idea of what was going on in there. And so we went, moved forward with that concept that the oldest dated shells of that region. So that we went out and we made sure that what we were looking at were statistically valuable. And we had 17 of those within this circle here that all came out basically being the same age with time. And that gives us a date of about 10.8, somewhere about like that, 10,008. And that really fits that whole shoreline rising model. So that's the minimum living transgression. It doesn't actually give us the pinpoint in time when that erosion occurred, but it gives a pinpoint in time quickly after that. And so that's data from south, southwestern Kyuyu, Hakodate, Kosciuszko, western Prince of Wales, and, and so the age of those old deposits uh, across that portion of the study area, we think that's kind of dates when that four bulge collapsed. So the oldest shells are about 10.8. The oldest culture deposits are about 10.6. So the land kept rising relative to sea level, even though the terrace below had been eroded and cut. So where had the people been? They already knew about the tool making material from a wide variety of places. And this material was widely distributed by 10,400 years ago. So uh, if you take a look at this, these folks that were living on the landscape at these sites on that upper terrace that became available, they knew about the obsidians on Sumez, they knew about the argillite out next to the granite on Warren Island. They knew about the rhyolites on Southern Kupernoff and the quartz crystals up here in Rocky Pass. And they knew about the chert that comes out of Saginaw Bay. And they dispersed that throughout most of Southeast Alaska. So the, there you do, that's the kind of information you don't get overnight. And it's hard to believe that they were able to acquire that in just a couple hundred years. So they had to be someplace on that landscape during the collapse of the four bowls and all this dynamic landscape changes going on. It's just a quick snapshot of basically what one of these sites look like today. Here's the forest today. Uh, one of the test pits right here and just the wide variety of material that can be found in those test pits from obsidian to rhyolites to chertz, uh, shale deposits for really rich siliceous shale and quartz crystals. I still to this day have no idea how they were striking quartz crystal microblades. So these are very, very small 
like those about th there's three millimeters right there. So these are small microblades that were being driven off of cores, and they were using that as cutting surfaces or knife blades themselves. So this, uh, but what's fascinating from a geologic point of view is the fact that they were able to get this from so many sources across the Tongass in such a little time after that place became available to live. So this is kind of the possibility of different ways, the coastal migration, the land bridge hypothesis, the sewer rain hypothesis. And basically what all this data shows us is at 16,900 years ago, we were open to receive guests. There was habitat out there that animals and humans could have occupied. It was a changing environment. It was a rapidly evolving environment, but it was out of the ice and it was open at least 900 years earlier than most had thought. And from the early model, the wall of ice model, that's almost 7,000 years earlier that people could have come along that coastline. So the continental ice sheet occupied the outer islands of Southeast Alaska from about 20 to 17,000 years ago. The terminus was on the then exposed shelf. We have found no areas in the islands that we have looked at to date, except for possibly uh, uh, Kruzoff Island and Mount Edgecombe that have, that, aren't, that weren't glaciated. As hard as we might look, we have not found the refugia yet. So the refugia had to be on the shelf. Deglaciation began at 169, rising sea level outpaced isostatic rebound at 14. And between 169 and 14, the ice retreated from all the fjords, channels, and passages to the elevation of the highest shell occurrence. The large coastal rivers like the Taku and the Stikine and the Iskut and the Unic and the Nass would have been fjords with tidewater glaciers in their valleys. The early presence of pine and spruce and mountain hemlock from cores and fossils from the caves suggest the local refugia was nearby, now in the now exposed shelf. The four bulge existed along the western margin of most of southeast Alaska until about 10,800 years ago. The oldest occupation yet dates to about 10,500, 10,600 years BP. These people already knew the location of and had dispersed tool materials throughout Southeast Alaska. It's possible that we had warmer summers and climate persisted from 7,600 to 11,000 years ago and there was fire in our ecology. Deglaciation beginning at 16,900 is at least 900 years before the reported first bolts of human migration to the Americans. Therefore, with the presence of the four bolts west of the archipelago and earlier deglation, deglaciation, the region would have been open as a path to the new world. If you take all of that, you kind of come up with a southeast Alaska at about 14,000 years ago. I'm not showing the ice caps stranded on the islands and the glaciers in the valleys, but this is what sea level would have looked like at that time. So we had a shoreline at that time at about 120 meters below present, creating at least a minimum of a 30 meter four bulge out in the front at that time. And you can see all the big rivers, the, the Taku and the Stikine and the Iskut and the Unic and the Nass and those rivers down in here were fjords way back up into Canada themselves. And Admiralty Island and Midkoff and all of these islands, uh, Kuyu was a multitude of smaller islands, as Prince of Wales was actually split right here into two islands. So this is kind of that environment at that time, what we would have had. It's a wholly different way of looking at what Southeast Alaska might have looked like as those folks that were moving through to uh, uh, the lower parts of North America were moving by our shorelines. I want to thank you for your time. I hope we have a bunch of questions. I don't know how we can get this out to the public. I know this gets recorded, but this is an example of just kind of a collection of some of the stuff, most just recent. Most of these papers are in the last few years <clears throat> and covers a lot of the stuff that we've just got or talked about in here. Any questions? Katie, do you take it over from here? <laughs> Hang on. Okay.
okay. I'm not sure if you can okay. see the chat or not, um, Jim. Can you see the chat window? Matt's already got a question up there. Okay, I got a. Oh, what the, oh, boy, look at that. Okay. <laughs> Presumably, the striations and such are evidence of the latest movements of the ice during the ice age. Is this any reason to think those were consistent throughout the ice age? No. So what they represent is the last ice movement. So the, if you had a stranded ice cap where everything had been moving out, let's say from Zarembo in the center part of Prince of Wales, suddenly has a stranded ice cap because all the fjords at Sumner Street and Clarence Street and everything flooded, then that ice cap would have collapsed out radially. And those glacial striations would show that. And so would the things that you find on the landscape. <clears throat> so we try to get them in areas where we probably wouldn't have had stranded ice. Thank you, Matt. I don't know if you know it at Sitka, you actually have a web page you can go record glacial striations on that Matt Goff set up, I don't know how many years ago now. But there's a web page you can do this on. Maybe Matt, you One can question? link in the oh chat. God. I so should have put out a I should have put out a, a test or something at the end of this. <laughs> so um, do people want to put their questions in the chat or you can indicate to me that you have a question and you can unmute yourself and, and go for it. Oh, there's one from Riley. Why did the lobe of ice coming out of Chatham go, why did the lobe of ice coming out of Chatham go north? Uh, 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 around the continental shelf, it 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 comes down out of the out of yeah it does the it and then it definitely kicked north right in there. We were kind of wondering if it had something to do with the way that the ocean currents flowed along that period, and then the fan that it put out now has because of the Queen Charlotte Fault has moved way north. So. The sediment lobe that came out of Chatham Strait now is not lined up with Chatham Strait because of oh, you know, oh, of basically 16,000 years of the fault line. But there is definitely a little bit of a northern kick right there uh, in the end of the Chatham stuff. There's a big, huge moraine out right there, and then between the Hazy Islands and the end of Baranoff is another great big moraine when you get some of the other bathymetry and stuff that I don't have. So. Uh, Matt, what is the advantage of using erratics instead of bedrock? Bedrocks can have what's called inheritance. So if you have a glacier coming across the landscape, hopefully it completely grinds off any cosmogenic stuff that happened 127,000 years ago. So if the, if the cosmogenic rays during the last interglacial altered the bedrock, that altered bedrock minerals are still there. You want the glacier to completely take that off. If you measure bedrock and you measure the erratics in the same age, you know you had a lot of ice on there and it completely scoured it off. If you measure the bedrock and let's say the erratic is 17,000 years old and the bedrock is 25,000 years old, then you know you had some kind of an inheritance left in that. And maybe the ice wasn't super thick at that site because it didn't grind off all of that previously cosmogenic altered mineralization. So we use the erratics assuming that all that stuff was ground off. What's the best guess to why we haven't found cultural sites older than 10-6? They would have been living most likely on the shoreline and you saw how rapid that was rising. And so those sites now would more than likely be submerged under the present sea level. Or that the land was so dynamic <clears throat> along that collapsing foreboats that humans were someplace else on the landscape and we haven't figured that out yet. So I don't know, I don't know what the answer is to that. 
Always hopeful, though. Always hopeful. Uh, have you worked with the Native community to see what their oral history is? Yes, but not near enough. Um, it seems to be that the geology really supports the oral history that's there. And so it, it totally makes sense to me that 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 whole idea of having to move so rapidly at the end of the Ice Age records the fact that their villages were being inundated so rapidly with that collapsing four bulge and they were on that outer coast. And so maybe they had to move from Southeast for a period and then they came back. But that's also uh, some of the stories talk about that. So I think it fits really well. Uh, how much is the maximum height of ice in the fjord to Southeast Alaska? I'm hoping that this information that we're trying to get published will then get to uh, what that's the missing link. I haven't had some uh, a glaciologist or some uh, geophysicist take a look at what does a thousand feet of isostatic rebound at Juneau mean for the weight of the ice. You have to take a look at what's going on with the uh, crust and the dynamics of the crust, but what's going on? What does that tell us? And how does that tell us the way ice moved across the landscape? So I'm hoping that what we're trying to present in this paper will get that answer. <clears throat> Just pondering here, could there be any correlation between the crust warming up, getting ready to blow up the Mount Edgecombe and the receding of the ice? Actually, the blowing up of Mount Edgecombe, the eruption of stuff outside of Craig and the eruption of stuff in behind Ketchikan all correspond to about 2,000 years after the maximum extent of ice and deglaciation started and you start to get the most flexure of the earth's crust. It wasn't the warming up that did it, it was the fact that you were having uh, that flexure opening up and closing uh, conduits in which the magma can come to the surface. And so there is a direct tie between glacial activity or volcanism and glacial recession about 2,000 years after maximal glaciation when you start to get the maximum movement of that land. That's a good question. Thank you. Do you know how salmon runs adjusted to the changes? <coughs> there was, um, let's see, there was a paper, ooh, clear back in 1995, that was done. Uh, out of Ock Bay that talked about salmon populations on the outer coast had older genetics than the salmon populations on the inner coast. But you could imagine with that much dynamic movement of the earth on the inner coast, those streams probably weren't very habitable with the amount of silt that was in them coming with the salmon stuff. So we definitely start seeing in the marine sediments and stuff by about 10,800 years, you start finding salmon bones in those sediments. So. The streams had settled down by that time enough that things could get established, but I believe that those salmon were living in the refugia on the outer coast and then come back into those uh, streams on the inland when they became available. When you took your rock sample, did you leave any notions of the science that who show up with an X number? <laughs> so the hole in the rock. The really deviant part of me wants to go down to something like Archie McPhee's and buy a bunch of little plastic Elvis and glue in the bottom of those holes and leave them all over up in the Alpine. <laughs> so hopefully somebody will understand, just like we find all the time, we find the cores where they were doing magnetic mapping of where the continents were and stuff. Uh, hopefully people will understand by that time that, oh, that was just Bachel up there cutting rocks out so that he could figure out how when the ice left this place. I like the idea of putting little Elvises in the box. So. I think that would be pretty fun. Are there any more questions? Oh. <laughs> um, I, so my question is, there was a wall of ice, but we have to move it back in time? It was a wall of ice. <laughs> so it was complex because you know you know how glaciers come together and you had beautiful lobes of ice coming out and it wasn't just a, a wall of ice out to the edge of the continental margin. It did get out onto continental margin and the big ice flows coming out Glacier Bay, the Yukobi Ice thing coming out uh, Chatham Strait, coming out Dixon Entrance. It might have had one that came out, but I can't find any evidence for it to go and go beyond Noyes. 
Uh, actually, when you're flying around Noyes Island with helicopters, you can see these walls have huge, big glacial striations on it, and all of a sudden, nothing. And that's about where the bathymetry shows that the ice hit it out there. So I think it was a cool landscape with about, you know, the ice would have feathered out to a thinner edge at the margin. Uh, you had a lot of ice in the middle of places. I think that the, the dynamics of the landscape, if you take all the ice out of all the fjords and straits and the huge chunks of ice that had to be left for several thousand years on most islands uh, must have been pretty dramatic. I'm sure central Prince of Wales, where you see these radiating drumlin, that gets back to the question about does the glacial striations give you the overall ice movement or the, well, the last ice movement? It's the last ice movement. But you can see these radial patterns. So, so there was one it's a back wacky, crazy, dynamic place. And you think about the huge, huge vegetation changes from herb-dominated tundra to the rainforest we have today, and all of this stuff going on. And it's just, it's just, it's amazing to think of in a relatively short geologic period of time these dramatic changes that we've undergone. And people were trying to make a living on that landscape. It's impressive. Um, did you, J Bill Hansen had a question that's, I'm still confused about where the refugia on the outer coast would have been. Uh, can I share the screen? Yeah, I can share the screen again. Let's go back over here and share. And if I back up one, doop. Nope, can't do that one. I'm going to do this. There. So here's, you can see where the islands are today, and all of this shelf out here would have been refugia. And this is at 14,000 years. At 16,000 years, it's way out beyond that. So all of this here is inundated with water today. It is sub, it's underneath the ocean today, but that would have been refugia along that outer coast at this time. So the refugia was to the west of the existing shorelines of Chichagov, Baranoff, Coronation, QU, and the islands to the west of Prince of Wales. Hopefully that helped clarify that. Um, let's see, I'm gonna skip down to Barbara's, just sorry, Matt. Um, are there plans to try to get data from underwater places that might be cultural sites? So we were, we were talking and the, there's a bunch of new information just came out of Coors South of Sumez and it shows a big erosional layer when that, when the transgression or when the sea level rolled across that landscape. And I never thought about such a rapid rising sea level where the fetch of the sea is extreme where that might have really eroded those sites so i guess you could have some preserved there but the little teeny bit of data we have like three cores show a huge erosional interface at, at that precise time when that water rolled over that landscape so i don't know what might be left out there could the, you know, people were living in the underwater places that's underwater today. There's probably no doubt about that. But if whether something is actually preserved or not would be really hard to just find. It would just be hard to find. They were hunters and gatherers on the landscape. They, they weren't building temples that we know <laughs> of. So Matt did have a question up there. If you have time to answer that one last question, that would be great. Where's that? Um, it's at the chat. It was how long does it take for a wave cut? To how long did it take? That one. Paris to develop. It must have developed in. So, Matt, I find the, the biggest terraces is where the fetch of the sea is the greatest, or whether you have a fluvial system bringing in sediment. So, if you have a fluvial system bringing in sediment, then you have a big terrace that forms at that, but it's also has to be a function. The, the better shorelines are preserved for the fetch of the sea is the greatest. So I don't think it takes that long. I don't think that that set there for longer than 
10, 15 years maximum to create that big wave cut front that truncates all of those glacial features. I think that this was a pretty dang dynamic landscape and it, it, this happened relatively rapidly. So if we're right about the clam beds limiting when the four bulge collapse happened, that's only a 200 year time for that terrace to rise and have people's, and I'm sure we haven't found the oldest cultural site on those terraces, so maybe it only was 100 years. So I, I would say that it's, it's probably in the vicinity of like 20 to 25 years for a wave cut terrace like that to develop. Because out of those glacial sediments where that fetch was great, you would have had a lot of sediment to be building those terraces. There you go. You're <laughs> muted, Kitty. I know, I was like, oh, brilliant. <laughs> Thanks so much for <laughs> Interesting talk. I, I will confess I took a couple of pictures of some of those images so I could like study them longer. Um, but there will be a recording available. It seems like it's taking a couple of weeks um, to get those all corrected and um, and I believe they're also being made accessible um, to hear it. Do they have captions, Kenny? Is that part of what's happening? Um, we're using the YouTube captions that come up, but um, but yeah, and actually it doesn't take that long to, to get posted now since we don't have to do the correct captions and all that stuff. Oh, okay, <laughs> but, great. Uh, yeah, but those will be posted to the Egan Lecture site where people went to register. So instead of the registration button, there will be a view video button and it'll take them right there. Great. Well, thanks everyone for attending. So anybody could write. Anybody could write my uh, email address and and uh, ask further questions. Hello, Clay. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everybody. I don't know how much we ended up with on there, but that was fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, yes. Although I miss the people, up, but this isn't bad. Yeah, it's 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 be it's a lot better than not having it at all. Uh, yes, but I definitely miss seeing people in the same room and can hardly wait until it happens again. Yeah. Well, you know we're going to have some new data specifically around Sitka coming up with this glacial erratic stuff. And well, you got to meet Jason and Caleb and the crew. Yes, I gave him a boat ride. Good answer. <laughs> so I'm hoping that uh, we get to have another talk in Sitka and we'll figure out how to make it accessible to folks who are in Juneau and elsewhere. Yeah. All right. All right. Anywho, thank you guys. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty. Oh, thank you, <laughs> uh, Matt Goff. Jason, uh, Jason and Caleb are waiting for the dates on the basalt, but the basalt was not good enough quality to date. Oh, bummer. I know. Hello, Rachel Myron. Thank you for doing this. Well, we'll have to. Yeah, man, I know. We were. So last year I had them go out, I, on, I asked a really good high resolution digital imagery and on the other side of the island I found like a 15 meter wide dike that probably was part of the fissure that fed the now underwater basalt that goes clear down to minus 180 meters off of Edgecombe out there and so they sampled that and we're going to try to get a date of that. I'm still waiting i had been working with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game when they do their calm fish stuff to, uh, they were going to possibly let us use their ORV to collect some rock samples from down below the uh, tide line out there, but that didn't happen because of COVID this summer. So if anybody out there has some ORV that can, with a big grabber that needs to get rocks, we need rocks outside of Sitka. It's got to be good rocks, though. It can't be vesicular basalt. I got to have solid basalt. Matt, you should own an ORV and you should take me out there. <laughs> <laughs> I can. I'll, I'll do the boat driving. We'll let Matt buy the ORV. 
That's right. Oh, yes. Future adventures. All right. Katie, it's good to see everybody. <laughs> Thank nice you. Have a great weekend. You. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.